It's good to be back at Social Justice Week here at Sonoma State University and see some familiar faces, actually quite a few familiar faces. Um, was here, had the pleasure of uh, speaking last year and uh, the topic was uh, frightfully similar because uh, the so-called scourge or phenomenon of fake news is still with us. Um, the, the news flash, of course, was uh, that fake news isn't anything new. It's in fact been with us for a very, very long time. Uh, the term fake news has actually even taken on many different iterations. So I figure for the evening, um, there's too many things to say, really. So I'll try to keep uh, the remarks to a reasonable time. And as somebody that lectures for several hours, reasonable would mean less than that. Um, because it's also interesting to hear your feedback and uh, hear your commentary, your perspectives, and uh, any questions. Not that I can always answer all of them, but um, that's certainly the that's certainly a more enjoyable part of all of this uh, overall. So the title of the talk, um, first of all, I want to thank everybody that Peter Phillips has been working with at, uh, here at the university, not just on Project Censored, which he took over from Carl Jensen uh, back in 1996-97. Uh, Carl Jensen founded Project Censored here back in 1976, so we're in our 42nd year. Um, we do these books every year. Um, this is our latest. It's Censored 2018, Press Freedoms in a Post-Truth World with Andy Lee Roth. Uh, I've done about eight of these with Andy Lee Roth. I'm finishing my 10th censored book actually with him right now. Uh, so apparently censorship is something that isn't disappearing. It's not going away. And in fact, in an era of so-called fake news, there are more problems to deal with, with with media and news journalism in general. But again, special thanks to Peter, all of the students that put together Social Justice Week. If you haven't seen the calendar, please check it out. There's still more going on. This is the middle of the week. And there's a lot going on um, tomorrow and also Friday, including uh, Glenn Ford will be speaking uh, from Black Agenda Report. So if you're not familiar with him, I would strongly urge you coming out and seeing, seeing him. Um, so where, where to begin? Well, the title of the talk was Fake News and the Truth Emergency. So some of you that are uh, follow Project Censored at all may remember that it has been, well, more than a decade, but at least a decade ago when we convened a conference in Santa Cruz that talked about our, our ongoing truth emergency. And Peter and I actually wrote about this in several of the censored books and it related to not just media reform, but what we were calling for, which was a radical restructuring of media and an increase of critical media literacy education. And we'll touch more on that in a bit. Um, we, we wrote, however, that, and this is what we meant by truth emergency, so you know. In the United States, the rift between reality and reporting has reached its end. There is no longer a mere credibility gap, but rather a literal truth emergency. Americans cannot access the truth about the issues that most impact their lives by relying on so-called mainstream media that we more accurately refer to as corporate media. A truth emergency is a culmination of the failures of the fourth estate to act as a truly free press. This truth emergency exists not only as a result of fraudulent elections, inconclusive 9-11 investigations, illegal preemptive wars, torture camps, doctored intelligence, but also around issues that intimately impact everyday Americans. Yet, these issues are rarely reported in corporate media outlets where a vast majority of the American people continue to turn for news and information. We wrote that over a decade ago. And again, it could have been written yesterday. And if you sub out um, this so-called truth emergency and you begin using the language that social media tech giants are using about fake news, right, you'll see that, and we're going to get to this in a little bit, um, but the whole moniker of fake news was really generated, created, and has even further morphed into a weaponized term to be used to discredit anything that challenges establishment narratives. Uh, or on an individual level, anything that one, uh, with, one, with which one disagrees. So we, and, and again, we've been talking about this for quite, quite some time, and even with the iteration of fake news, uh, it led us last year 
to begin talking about, well, what, wh in what climate did this terminology um, come forward? And we go back and we, we, we look at coming out of the election of 2016, some of the first cries about uh, problems of fake news actually were emanating from the Democratic Party establishment and the corporate news media um, about their lackluster performance in holding candidates accountable, um, especially since many in the not only journalist establishment, but clearly in the Democratic uh, National uh, Committee and Party establishment, were just mystified by how somehow Donald Trump uh, had enough votes to be close enough to win in the Electoral College. You'll notice I did not say that he won the majority vote because he did not. But rather than, you know, start pointing fingers at an antiquated elitist institution like the Electoral College, rather than looking at uh, a, an election cycle that produced the two least popular presidential candidates for two major parties in recorded history, uh, not the lackluster support for the neoliberal dynastic candidate in Hillary Rodham Clinton, and to say that is uh, in no way uh, a sexist comment. Uh, criticizing the policies of Hillary Clinton has nothing to do with sexism or misogyny. Were there people that were misogynistic and were uh, making incredibly disparaging remarks about Hillary Clinton as a woman? Yes, there were. Should those have been called out by the media? Absolutely. Were they? Not always with great zeal. And in fact, sometimes the media acted to amplify those only to get sucked into Trump's Twitter campaigns where they actually became part of their own stories. That's pretty much when things ended in terms of having credibility in the election cycle. As far as corporate media was concerned, we'll come back to that in a bit. But instead of blaming, you know, looking for the many different root causes for sort of how things happened the way they did, um, and you'll remember most of the media, corporate media pundits were aghast, jaws agape at the outcome of the election. Um, in large part, as we know from people like Alexander Zaitchek and a few other journalists that traveled around, uh, even Michael Moore, who was one of the very few people that said out loud that Trump was going to end up in the White House. Uh, most of those calls were completely ignored. Uh, they were ignored so much that the Democrats decided to not campaign in, in Rust Belt states where they ended up, well, having things to be close enough so that they can be stolen. Is there election chicanery afoot? Absolutely. Is there a problem of cross-check and voter suppression? Absolutely. Is it a known phenomenon that hacking of voting machines occurs outside of anything that goes on with Vladimir Putin and Russia? Yes, absolutely. That occurs. I mean, I'm losing track of how many things I'm mentioning that resulted in the outcome of the election. Um, notice that I haven't blamed fake news for the outcome of the election yet. And I won't. Because there isn't demonstrable proof that any kind of, quote, ads taken out on social media uh, or Russian, you know, the use of Russian bots from the Internet Research Agency or these types of things. We know that this happened. But there's no metric or no measurable evidence that shows what the outcome of that was. And it was actually, from what we know, uh, quite paltry on the scale that we, uh, in other words, if you add up how much free coverage went to Trump by the corporate media, you end up with multiple billions with a B of dollars. Last count, the total was roughly six. Hillary received about three, Sanders under two. So if there's anybody promoting information and not doing a job with investigative reporting and spreading hearsay and propaganda, look no further than the corporate media in our own country for failing to cover adequate issues in the 2016 election. By the way, they've all admitted it after the fact. They admitted their gross negligence and abject failure. In fact, in one of my favorite yet obviously awful quotations from that election cycle in our latest uh, in our latest book let's see if I can I can quickly track it down um, you actually may be familiar with this because it's something that I know that has been making the rounds but I glommed on to this pretty early on and what was that it was the admission of the CEO of CBS uh, whose name is Les Moonves 
Les Moonves admitted out loud at a tech convention in San Francisco in the summer of 2016 that, in fact, while there, the network coverage of Trump and the campaign was, again, drifting toward yellow journalism, Moonves said, keep going, Donald, keep going. It might be bad for America, but it's damn good for CBS. <laughs> it bears repeating over and over that these people knew what they were doing, they knew what they were amplifying, and then they were somehow surprised at the outcome. Well, during that period, right, that's when you saw the Democratic Party and corporate media establishment and the punditocracy begin to blame fake news. And that blame of fake news then morphed very quickly into what is now shifting baselines, moving goalposts, turned into Russian meddling. I think that's what it is this month, this past month, right? Over the last year, it was Russia hacked the election. Well, there's no evidence of that. Then it was Russia could hack the election. Okay. Then the CIA came out, always a believable source, and came out, again, since World War II, the United States has interfered in the elections of 81 countries. Just bookmark that. So the fact that other countries interfere in other countries' elections is obviously a thing. Uh, is it likely that Russia was attempting to, quote, meddle in the U.S. election, with, you know, given what the outcomes could be and what the policies were and the outspoken uh, bellicosity coming from the Clinton campaign? Sure. I mean, in this day and age, I'm not sure why that would be even surprising. But to keep claiming it over and over with no actual evidence or with circumstantial evidence or with hacking turning to leaking, turning to colluding, turning to meddling, if there's a there there, we're still waiting for it. And perhaps the Mueller investigation will yield something other than RICO cases or corrupt business deals and money laundering and Lord knows what else. It looks like a, a menagerie of corruption and uh, business catastrophes. And it obviously bleeds into the political sphere. But between Russia and fake news, this is sort of where we have the, the, the corporate media and Democratic Party establishment continually repeating uh, about what happened in the last election. But again, I want to go back to Moonves, and I want to go back to, um, you know, let's say the Washington Post, which is owned by Jeff Bezos, who is the wealthiest person on the planet. Um, Forbes just ranked him the wealthiest person on the planet at uh, a net worth of somewhere in the neighborhood of $112 billion. Uh, pay, Bill Gates trailing, trailing behind at $90 billion. We hope that he can... Uh, hobble his way along and, and make a go of things. Um, in fact, uh, you know, the, the latest Oxfam studies, and they're experiencing some serious problems of their own, but putting that aside momentarily, um, uh, some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 42 people have as much wealth as, the lo as, as half the population of the planet. So, again, we have some pretty significant wealth inequality that the news media could be reporting on instead of Trump's latest tweet. Um, but nevertheless, Bezos owns the Post, Amazon, Whole Foods, you know, down the line. Uh, when he bought the Post, it wasn't long after that he had a $600 million cloud contract with the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, so again, back, now we're back to the CIA, now we're involving media. But no one uh, really at the Washington Post wanted to take, take um, you know, any actual uh, investigative uh, attempts to figure out what went on in the election. So they jumped on the fake news bandwagon. In fact, their own media uh, critic, Margaret Sullivan, said that at some point, right after the election, that she was already tired of the moniker of fake news and that they probably needed to come up with a different term. And the big reason for that was because they no longer controlled its use. Because Donald Trump immediately seized upon the opportunity to use fake news as a weaponized term to basically claim anything with which he disagrees is fake news. So thanks to Donald Trump, my six-year-old son, if he doesn't like something I'm saying, I'm fake news. Right? A true, true story. 
True story. He said that about two weeks ago. And then it's, it's devolved from there, right? Now there's fake news in my heart, right? All the, these kinds of fun things. So good times sent home. Um, but again, you know, it's an interesting term, fake news. And again, I'm going to come circle back around and pile a little bit on Bezos and the CIA and the Washington Post, um, which, by the way, Steven Spielberg is trying to give a, a facelift to in, in theaters nowadays. So if you're interested in the, in the half-truths of the Post, um, the post-truth world at the Washington Post, you can go check out the movie. Um, Ellsberg, Dan Ellsberg, the leaker of the Pentagon Papers, actually has a very small role overall in, uh, in the film, even though... Interestingly enough, um, that was a that was a really huge issue at the time, and it also shows how the, the, the how the the institutional the traditional news media as a fourth state in this country used to support whistleblowers, and used to occasionally, right, run these kinds of stories that held people in power accountable. Um, now it's often personal foibles, personal scandals, these kind of things, and the fourth estate has long crumbled. But back to, again, we were talking about this truth emergency and morphing into um, the problems of now fake news. Um, I wanted to add to say that um, now that the, the term is weaponized, now that it's routinely in the culture, now that it's being used all over the place to accompany a, a, another attack on, on news media where Trump is referred to them as the enemy of the people, right? And by the way, the problem here is multifaceted and layered because we do know the corporate news media uh, function as a propaganda arm, both of their own interests, their shareholders, and occasionally the state. Um, but that's not what Trump's referring to. Trump's referring to the corporate news media as fake when they run critical stories or attempt to before they get sucked into their own narratives and they become part of the story. Where that's most recently uh, manifests, anybody notice this week, Sam uh, Nunberg, epic, non sequitur, bizarre meltdown on CNN? Anybody see that? Um, it's, it's all over the place if you haven't seen it. Um, and at one point, uh, the journalist at CNN even, even asked him if he was drunk, uh, what's going on with you. Uh, but nevertheless, these folks went on and on and on. And CNN covered this as if it was a story about how this person wasn't going to testify in the Mueller investigation. And that, um, you just again, one non sequitur after another. It, they covered it all day long. It's still in the news cycle. They're still talking about it. It turned, well, what's wrong with him? And then, of course, the retort from the White House is like, well, that's fake news and CNN's fake news. Right, on and on it goes. Meanwhile, anything else going on last week that might be worth reporting? Like anything at all? How about Putin's State of the Union address, which also functioned as a propaganda speech for the, quote, election that's taking place there. You know, there's obviously problems in the Russian elections, too. In fact, if I remember correctly, we've been meddling in Russian political affairs for at least 100 years, <laughs> going all the way back to the revolution in 1917 and 18, um, helped uh, Boris Yeltsin get in. Um, I mean, again, so Chalmers Johnson uh, would refer to this as a blowback issue, and the CIA actually has the term blowback to talk about unintended consequences of covert actions. Well, meddling in Russian elections then might reasonably end up with Russia attempting to meddle in U.S. elections. But taking out ads and using our own social media and our own news sources uh, against us, I think, is um, I think almost a humorous story. Um, and all of the efforts that have been you know, put forward to address this problem and to address the so-called problem of fake news uh, are pretty much abject failures, and we're going to talk about those uh, in a few minutes. But just back to this issue of, you know, how did we get here with fake news? Uh, and where, 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 where is this term going? Um, the, and again, I want to reiterate, there's nothing new about it. In fact, the term fake news even uh, propped up in the 19th century uh, where there were you know, prominent uh, newspapers that ran stories about you know, people on the moon and other kind of crazy stuff. Um, you, you will also know that fake news uh, morphed its way into the term yellow journalism by the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. So w there we have this problem, still there, still going. Um, then we had issues of um, fake news and reporting going on uh, around the USS Maine in the start of the Spanish-American War. So again, that's not new there. Um, we had issues and problems with so-called fake news with an alleged Axis invasion of the US um, where um, San Francisco News 
uh, claimed that there was some kind of bombing run or Japanese planes off the coast of California in uh, what became known as the Battle of Los Angeles. Um, this was a false alarm. Uh, not entirely unlike the completely inexcusable false alarm that just took place for a missile attack that wasn't coming in Hawaii. Uh, remember, that just happened not long ago. Um, of course, we all know that there were problems with so-called fake news about the Russian missile gap that actually didn't exist. Um, how about the body counts in Vietnam? That's long been admitted that that was basically fake reporting. Notice how I'm morphing from fake news as entertainment to fake news as real news or real fake news, <laughs> right? No notice how the lines are all blurring here. Well, again, this is the same kind of problem that we've been experiencing in the present. So that's, again, why I'm saying that this really isn't new, right? The term fake news hasn't always been employed, but it's back. It's with us. Um, you know, what, uh, we also had the problems, um, 1988 election with Michael Dukakis, um, the whole idea that he was soft on crime and the Willie Horton ads and this kind of thing. Um, was was pretty amazing. Uh, Lee Atwater, Bush's camp, George Senior Bush's campaign manager at the time, acknowledged that his plan for Dukakis said, "Quote: I said I would strip the bark off the little bastard and make Willie Horton his running mate." I mean, again, he's basically admitting that this stuff is whole cloth. It's it's manufactured. What's one thing that we have in common with all of these kinds of examples? Right? One thing we have in common. Well, this is also propaganda. Fake news is simply propaganda. Um, and propaganda is nothing new at all. The use of the term fake news 10 years ago actually referred to, literally to satire. It referred to Stephen Colbert in The Daily Show. Right? It referred to this idea that this is funny, they're poking fun at things going on in the headlines, um, and they make it appear as though it's news, and through comedy, they're actually able to report things that the corporate news media can't, won't, and don't, <laughs> right? Uh, so we had to actually rely on satirical fake news to get any kind of actual news. Uh, and nowadays, that same genre has, uh, it actually has a name. Uh, it's called investigative comedy. Anybody, anybody heard that term lately? Yeah? So Lee Camp comes to mind, right? Uh, you probably are familiar with John Oliver on HBO, um, right? But, but notice how now that's not being called fake news, it's being called investigative comedy. Well, we saw that when Lenny Bruce did it. We saw that when George Carlin did it. We saw that when Bill Hicks did it. It wasn't called investigative comedy though, right? So no matter what monikers we're using or what labels we're using, we just need to remember that there's ever been an attempt to deceive. There's always an effort to control information. There's always been an effort to control narratives and dialogue while simultaneously censoring and suppressing any narratives that might call attention to corruption by those in power. And, so, and this is not unique to the United States. But it is, however, um, very interesting that in U.S. history, there have been de deliberate and concerted, uh, concerted attempts to misinform or disinform the public through propaganda. And there, the list is very long, and it's been demonstrated tome after tome after tome. I mentioned a few things right here down a list a little bit ago, um, and I can mention, uh, unfortunately, a lot more, but um, I, I, wanna, I wanna at least call attention to the genesis of this issue in an official capacity in the United States 100 years ago. And then I do want to jump up closer to the present and say a few things about some things that are happening now. Um, so some of you may remember the nephew of Sigmund Freud, um, Edward Bernays, who actually wrote a little book in 1928, literally called propaganda. Before that was a dirty word. And again, I, I often bring this up in a lot of public talks because in my view, it bears so much repetition. It, it's actually quite astonishing that despite, despite how much this has been documented and reported and recorded, particularly in academic circles, communication circles, etc., it's always mind-boggling to me how people either don't know, never heard of, or don't recall Edward Bernays. Uh, the reason I bring it up is this is the how-to manual. This is before propaganda was considered a dirty word, right? 
it's, you know, propaganda went through the ringer in through World War II after people like Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, uh, Goering, and others got a hold of Bernays' little book. Remember that Hitler was writing about this when he was in jail writing Mein Kampf after the Beer Hall Putsch, saying that, you know, next time if the Germans get a chance to do something, we should m mimic the American media programs that they ran through the Creel Commission and the Committee on Public Information, of which Bernays was part. Right? So if they can kind of control the narrative from behind the scenes, uh, they, they might go far. <laughs> right? And I'll let you figure out how far the Nazis went. But pretty far. Um, in fact, they're still with us, neo-Nazis. Um, nevertheless, this is a choice quote, and I, again, always have to read it. If you're familiar with it, bear with us. If you're not, let it sink in. Because this is the proof positive that there has been a... 100-year campaign to actively misinform, disinform, partially inform, or otherwise manipulate the public mind in the United States. Bernays literally writes, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Let that sink in. <laughs> The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Well, how democratic might it be then if that there is a direct admission that somebody somewhere is n not interested in you thinking independently and critically on your own? They're interested in manipulating or pushing you in a certain direction. And of course, the art of propaganda oft is subtle, and when you're not pushed too hard, you're led to, to believe that you come to these kinds of conclusions that you hold on your very own, right? And of course, that's what Bernays wants. He goes on to say that those who manipulate the unseen, this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. So he didn't use the term deep state or even secret government, but he used the term invisible government, which if you go in the literature of deep state theory, it's kind of a thing. It's the government that works below the surface that you don't always see. It doesn't have an address on Pennsylvania Avenue. And again, as he'll go on to say, Back to Bernays, we are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. Well, those would be people in this invisible government, right? That's who he's referring to. And in fact, at this time, Bernays is actually referring to himself. You know, back, back to our uh, friends in the CIA, William Casey, when he was director of the CIA in 1981, in one of his first meetings with President Ronald Reagan, journalist Barbara Honiger was there and captured this gem of a quote. We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Are we there yet? <laughs> Fake news. This is a long trajectory. This is a long time coming. This is a deliberate campaign. This does not mean that Putin and some Russian oligarchs are not also maybe trying to use our own media systems to sort of sow division or end up getting uh, more favorable type policies coming out of Washington because even though Pax Americana is waning, the U.S. is still a global hegemon. So again, it's common sense that we would suspect that some foreign actors had interests. But again, I've seen no evidence that we should be more worried about Russia than Diebold. Or the, pe the companies that own the voting systems. Or governors of states and secretary of states that cross-check people and kick them off the voting rolls. Right? There's a long-standing uh, problem with our voting systems. And I see Rick Lutman's here, and he could talk about that all day long, <laughs> and alternative forms of voting as solutions. And in fact, was on our show, uh, Project Censored show, uh, last year to talk about that. 
So anyway, back to Bernays. Bernays says, this is the logical result of the way in which democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they're to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics, business, in our social conduct or ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. He's saying this a hundred years ago. He wrote this book 90 years ago. He wrote the book 10 years after World War I is in the rearview mirror and the intellectual class is patting itself on the back for what a great job they did. By the way, look at the job that they did at Pearl Harbor the day that'll live in infamy where the Republicans were busy investigating the unprecedented third-term president, Franklin Roosevelt, for possibly ignoring warnings of the Pearl Harbor attacks. Well, guess what we know now? We know now what the Army knew in 1944 and what Roosevelt and his Secretary of War knew in 1941, that they knew the attacks were coming and they needed them to occur to provoke the United States population to enter a two-front war. And that's actually the subject of numerous books based on public documents, one of the more recent published in 2000 by Bob Stinnett called Day of Deceit. So I urge you to take a look at some of these things because in cursory form here, even though our books are littered with footnotes, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not showing them to you now. But don't take my word for it. Go out and investigate this stuff and look into it yourself. By the way, it's a spoiler alert. I'm giving you the main, the main theme here about how we solve the problems of fake news and propaganda, right? I'll give, you, I'll give you a hint. It's not even a secret. It's called critical thinking. And it's something that I've taught for almost 20 years. We don't have enough of it. We don't do enough of it. Again, bookmark that. So, well, again, where else do we have our problems? Where else do we see, where else do we see the hand of Bernays at work? Well, all through the Cold War, Bernays lived to be over 100 into the 1990s. You know, he had his hands on the Guatemala coup. He had his, his hands in various foreign policy um, uh, campaigns. He's also uh, one of the professional mentors of the major public relations firms people, like the Rendon Group. Peter Phillips has wrote at great length in our Censored 2017 book about public relations firms and what all they do and what they control, right? I mean, again, I, I want us to remember that, you know, we're talking about fake news, we're also talking about a culture that's experiencing a truth emergency, right? That this whole fake news culture, it keeps kind of calling attention to that we don't know what to believe anymore. I actually have decided to begin calling the current state in which we exist an epistemological crisis. And I'm going to touch more on that in a minute. Um, with a, a, a really disturbing set of developments that are on the so-called fake news front in social media. But again, I'll come back to that. But the Rendon Group and the PR firms, I mean, these are the people that sold the Iraq war. Um, Hill and Knowlton, major public relations firm. These are the people that with your taxpayer money, coached the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to lie to Congress about how Iraqis were throwing Kuwaiti babies out of incubators. Where'd she borrow that story? Well, that was one of Bernays' wonders from the Creel Commission when they lied about the Germans ripping the arms off of Belgian babies. I mean, they can't even make up their own original things. They just go back to history and they recycle things over and over again, like the theory of the mad brute, right? And it just comes over and over again. Uh, they're coming for our women. They're coming for our children, right? And then on it comes. Well, that's basically what Naira was doing uh, as the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. And then that then steamrolled us into a huge UN coalition based mostly on lies for the first Iraq war. We never ended that war. We started it again in 2003, but the United States and Britain never left, right? And you'll remember the Clinton years, we, we even heard a Secretary of State saying that the sanctions on Iraq that were responsible for killing over 500,000 people were worth it. 
And that just sort of floats out there as, well, oh, I, we can't seem to figure out why anybody would be questioning the U.S. Uh, hegemony around the world, and the U.S. is a benevolent kind of, of society as a government in the world. And it's the Rendon group that's going to do the same thing with WMDs, the fake toppling of the statue of Hussein, right? The, the rigged and staged rescue of Jessica Lynch, rescue of Jessica Lynch, right, who wasn't captured, she was in an accident, she was, the vehicle overturned, and the Iraqis helped her, and the doctors in Iraq took her and helped her, and then the Marines went barging in, but they waited for the television crew to get there first, right, because it was such an emergency, they said, well, before we rescue Jessica, can you set up the cameras? So the cameras are set up, and then they go in, and then they almost did actually kill her accidentally. Again, that's all staged. That's all staged. And the reason I keep bringing up these things is because it's really incredulous that we live in a culture where the corporate news media responsible for spreading all of this propaganda, these half-truths and lies, along with both parties in government, have the audacity to talk about fake news, <laughs> which is a currency in which they routinely peddle. So we should be paying a lot more attention to the real fake news. Should we be worried about Russian bots and troll farms? Not more than we should be worried about bots and troll farms of any kind. So the curious thing here with this fake news dilemma or epidemic is we now see more and more evidence. In fact, it's even again the CIA coming out and saying just in the last two years, and you might remember this, that before a couple years ago, no, no, no major person in the two major parties was talking about how our elections could be hacked. Uh, and, and in fact, the CIA and the FBI were claiming that our elections weren't hackable. Until the Democratic primaries and the outcome of the 2016 election, when the CIA came out and said, oh yeah, well, there's definitely technology now and Russia has it and they can hack our elections. Well, thankfully, because some of this material was leaked to Julian Assange at WikiLeaks, and I know we can say plenty of critical things about Assange, and we can just bookmark that too for later if you like, but we're, I'm not going to go there right this minute. What I am going to focus on is the data and the information that came out of the Vault 7 dump, where it was discovered that the CIA could not only hack any elections, but they can make it look like it comes from any country in the world. So I guess it's interesting that after the 2016 election, the CIA decided to come and be more officially public about the ability to hack elections because it already came out in their leaked documents that not only could they do it, but they had done it and they could make it look like it came from anywhere. I guess that would mean including the outcome of the 2016 election, <laughs> which might in fact be where that whole narrative came from, was the deep state. And I'm not joking about that. Because if you take a look, there are right now record numbers of intelligence officers, CIA people, and Pentagon intel officers running for public office as Democrats. I'm just saying to pay attention. This brings me to this, the following point about real fake news. And if we now live in an environment where we know that there are these um, troll farms, um, bots, uh, that social media can easily be used to spread falsehoods, rumors, propaganda. This takes it to a new level. And I know that over the years, we at Project Censored have dealt with very controversial topics, often because it is those topics that are censored or where free debate is curtailed, often by ostracism. No matter how serious you, get, you can get somebody, uh, a mathematician, somebody from MIT, others, to talk about the seriousness of the flaws of our electoral system, it's routinely met prior to the Russia narrative with jeers of conspiracy theories. And so we've heard over and over again how any of the questioning of this stuff was a conspiracy theory. And even though we were talking about what I'm going to mention here in a minute, we've been talking about this off and on for about 15 years we now actually have concrete evidence of this phenomenon. And this is why the term fake news probably isn't going away, but I would say more problematically, this is why we're really only on the cusp 
of the latest technological manifestations of the ramifications and consequences of information control, fake news, and propaganda. Which makes the solution that I've already posited all the more reasonable and all the more tenable. We can, we can reach it. We can teach critical media literacy. We can teach critical thinking. We can teach people how to be better skeptics. We can do that. But anybody in here know a technologist by the name of Aviv Ovadia? Anybody ever heard of Aviv Ovadia? Yeah, me, me, me too. I'm right there with you. I was like, who? <laughs> like, don't know this person. Well, here's why I know him now. In a presentation given right before the 2016 election, it was a San Francisco tech conference, not unlike the one Les Moonves was at, crowing about, keep going, Donald. Ovedia gave a talk that he called infocalypse, as in apocalypse, but information apocalypse. And so he neologized this term to say info, right? Info calypse, infocalypse. I'm almost saying something in the middle there, and it's probably apt that it would be said. He writes here. Warning of an impending crisis of misinformation. The web and information ecosystem that had developed around it was wildly unhealthy, Ovedia argued, right before the 2016 election. And this is somebody that's very familiar with Facebook, Twitter, worked with Quora, other companies, another MIT engineering grad. And Ovedia warns, the, incentive, the incentives that governed the biggest platforms, like Facebook, Twitter, Google searching, the incentives that governed the biggest platforms were calibrated to reward information that was often misleading and polarizing, or both. Google, Facebook, Twitter prioritized clicks, shares, ads, and money over veracity of information, information integrity, or overall quality of messaging. And Ovedia couldn't shake the feeling that it was all building towards something bad, a kind of critical threshold of addictive and toxic misinformation, including from Facebook and Twitter. Interestingly enough, there are a few people at this talk who later go on to work with Facebook's newsfeed integrity effort. Better late than ever, but we can chat about why that's problematic in a minute as well. Ovedia went on to say, at the time, it felt like we were in a car careening out of control. And it wasn't just that everyone was saying, we'll be fine. It's that they didn't even see the car. Alarmism could be good. You should be alarmist about this stuff, he said. before calmly outlining a deeply unsettling projection about the next two decades of fake news, artificial intelligence, assisted misinformation campaigns, and propaganda. Ovedia said, we are so screwed, it's beyond what most of us can imagine. We're utterly screwed a year and a half ago, and it's even worse now. Depending on how far you want to look into the future, it just gets worse. What's he getting at? He said, in the future, which is now, we are going to have a slew of slick, easy to use, and eventually seamless technological tools for manipulating perception and falsifying reality, for which terms have already been coined. Reality apathy, automated laser fishing, human puppets, as well as sock puppets. So what, what are these things, right? And why is this person, why is this tech person have such a completely grim outlook? Well, he said he realized that if these systems were going to go out of control, there'd be nothing to rein them in. And it was going to get bad quickly. 
He's referring to what, you know, this, this problem of the, the algorithms, confirmation bias, and the way technology feeds in to the pr issues of confirmation bias, which also is exacerbated by our lack of critical thinking skills. By the way, Ovedia now is the chief technologist at the University of Michigan Center for Social Media Responsibility, the Night News Innovation Fellow, uh, also at uh, Journalism School in Columbia. The shock and, and ongoing anxiety over Russian Facebook ads and Twitter bots pales in comparison to the greater threat. Technologies that can be used to enhance and distort what is real are evolving faster than our ability to understand, control, or mitigate. This is what he calls the info infocopolis, he says, right? This is what he's saying, in infocalypse. What happens when anyone can make it appear as if anything has happened, regardless of whether or not it did? This is why we need to be very careful about how this weaponized term of fake news is being toyed with and played with. And of course, we also see that the main issues that have been discussed to scale it back or to somehow address it have involved censorship, blacklisting, Google and Facebook are algorithmically doing that right now, burying and spiking certain news or outlets and organizations that have narratives that challenge their supremacy. That's going on right now. We know it. Eric Schmidt at Google admitted it. We have other uh, for, um, head engineers and programmers at Facebook even saying that they're actively working to suppress these information sources, all under the guise of fighting fake news. So you see where I'm going with this, is that fake news is the new Trojan horse term to legitimize censorship, to create blacklists. The Washington Post got in on the blacklisting last year with the proper not scandal, where they took this nebulous, you know, unaccountable, non-transparent organization, and they had this list of organizations that they called fake news or useful idiots for Russia, and they just ran it completely uncritically. And you know who wrote the article was a former national security editor named Craig Timberg. Convenient that he had a background in national security. While he's sitting there telling people that actual fake sites that literally make stuff up were on the same list as Counterpunch uh, or Truth Dig or Dave Lindorf's This Can't Be Happening. And Dave Lindorf and I just talked about this on a Project Censored show a couple weeks ago. Go back and check it out. Rob Williams and I just talked about uh, the problem of, of bots and filter bubbles and all kinds of, this is all stuff that we have documented on our website and our radio shows. I strongly encourage you to please go and check it out. Um, but Ovedia is now saying, which is, is really bad, is not only can we turn audio clips into realistic lip-synced videos, um, these tools are now more and more available. He even talks about something called diplomacy manipulation in which a malicious actor uses advanced technology to create the belief that an event occurred to influence geopolitics. I don't know, like the Gulf of Tonkin? <laughs> but the technology is far more sophisticated now than then. And this is what he sees as an incredible challenge that we're facing. In fact, he even went so far as to say... This technology doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be good enough to make an enemy think something happened. That it provokes a knee-jerk and reckless response of retaliation. So now we're getting into a history of false flags, right? Again, this technology has extraordinary, extraordinarily dangerous potentials. But unfortunately, outside of the tech sector, we don't really see a lot of people talking about this stuff. We don't really hear people talking about automated laser fishing, for example. Here's another term. I'll get to that in a second. Policy, or I'm sorry, polity simulation is a dystopian combination of political botnets and astroturfing where political movements are manipulated by fake grassroots campaigns. And Ovedia's envisioning increasingly believable uh, artificial intelligence powered bots will be able to effectively compete with real humans for legislator and regulator attention because it will be too difficult to tell the difference. Automated laser fishing is a tactic 
that he notes security researchers are already whispering about. Essentially, it's using AI to scan things like our social media presences and craft false but believable messages from people we know. The game changer, according to Avedia, is that something like laser fishing would allow bad actors to target anyone and to create a believable imitation of them using publicly available data. We wrote about Cambridge Analytica in the UK in our recent book, and they boast, and this is where Robert Mercer, the Mercer money is behind, also was behind Breitbart. Um, Cambridge Analytica boasts that they have somewhere around 5,000 data points on every registered American voter called from internet usage. I don't think I could think of 5,000 data points on myself, and I'm me. But this is what they're getting at here, is that this information is out there, and it is hackable, and it is manipulatable. And so for Oveda, he sees this literally as an information apocalypse. He says, he goes on to say, um, oh, he, has, he also used that term reality apathy, and by the way, this is something that other scholars have used uh, throughout the years. Um, but in this, in this instance, he's referring to reality apathy as this. Beset by a torrent of constant misinformation, people simply start to give up. Ovedi is quick to remind us that this is common in areas where information is poor and thus assumed to be incorrect. He said, quote, people stop paying attention to news and that fundamental level of informedness required for functional democracy becomes unstable. Well, ask ourselves what's happening in our news source. We have increased numbers of people that don't trust traditional news media. We have people that are constantly saying, well, they don't know what news media sources to trust. And so most people revert to their own confirmation bias. They have sources they're used to and they're comfortable with, and they basically say that those are the reasonable sources. If they're not familiar with the source, or they don't agree with something that a source says, then they can call it fake news. And this is, again, one of the consequences, this reality apathy, as it's being referred to. Uh, I'm not going to go on and, and keep boring you with some of these details, but basically where he's going is here. Another quote. You don't need to create the fake video for this tech to have serious impact. You just point to the fact that the technology exists and you can impugn the integrity of the stuff that's real. He's talking about the technological ability to create whole cloth video and audio of people doing and saying things that they never actually did and they never actually said. That technology exists and it's existing on a much more available basis to the consumer public. Just think about where this, that's going. <laughs> Talk about reality apathy. By the way, Donald Trump already did this. He already said that the technology exists to fake someone's voice or a video. Therefore, in his infamous grab them by the pussy remark, he said, I never said that. That's, a, that's fake news. They made that video. Trump actually already said it. Trump said, you don't need to create the fake video for this tech to have serious impact, right? He basically, Trump, Trump said that um, the technology exists to create this. This has been created. So he's now sticking to his narrative that this is fake news. So again, what, what Ovedia is saying is already happening. More, more back to the reality apathy. It'll only take a couple of big hoaxes to really convince the public that nothing is real. This is what Ovedia is imagining, which is quite dystopic. Um, 70? 70 years? No. 1939. Is that 70 years? 80. 70? Peter? That's 80 years. War of the Worlds. Remember that? <laughs> Remember War of the Worlds, the radio broadcast on CBS that was a fictional account of aliens? Yeah, I mean, it was based on, you know, you go back, it's, um, it's uh, based on the novel. 
um, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds, goes back to the 1890s. Orson Welles uh, was actually, you know, before he really got into filmmaking, was sort of a narrator. And uh, this aired in the U.S. in 1939. And a lot of people kind of coming in didn't realize or missed the announcement that this was not a, a, a true broadcast. And, and so people kind of started freaking out about it because it was made to sound like it was an actual news broadcast. Um, and as a result of that, you know, you saw FCC things coming on and you saw laws being passed about, hey, <laughs> in other words, fake news is illegal. <laughs> Basically the lesson you can take from that. Once again, how this is not new, right? But now this so-called war of the worlds problem is a war of words. How do we know what people are saying is true? How do we know if it's actually in context? How do we know if an actual event takes place? How do we know if there actually is a gas attack in Syria? And even if there is, who do we believe when there's fingers pointing on all sides of who's doing it? We see very quickly people rush in and say, well, we know that it's Assad and it's Assad's people. Well, notice how those are the same people that are crowing about intervention in Syria that are also very angry about what's happening in Syria with Russian intervention there. We have also seen in previous reports, stalwart investigative reporters like Cy Hirsch and others, uh, uh, Postel, uh, another MIT researcher that has looked into these problems and said, you know, we don't really know that Assad is doing this. In fact, there's actually evidence that, that this is coming from somewhere else. And, you know, this is a really controversial topic. Uh, even on the left, in fact, Deepa Kumar, who wrote the introduction to our book, when she was kind of talking about these problems, you know, she said, look, we really need academic freedom and, 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 and sort of the in, encouragement to openly have these dialogues where it's okay to disagree with people and not accuse them of being conspiracy theorists or peddling fake news. That's degrading the overall intellectual culture. And in fact, it is terribly anti-intellectual. The United States is no stranger to anti-intellectualism. But a lot of this stuff that's going on right now that's you know, offering the suggestion to help us with fake news, with censorship, with blacklisting, you know, that, that's all anti-intellectual. The intellectual response to the so-called fake news or epistemological crises is to teach more critical media literacy and have more critical media literacy education and critical pedagogy. That's the solution, is to tell, start teaching people when they're young how to ask these questions. In fact, we even, Susan Merritt, a librarian, teaches information integrity courses, works with us at the Global Critical Media Literacy Project. We actually have a list posted on our website, information integrity checklist. How do you check for information veracity? It's only two pages. It's a checklist you could carry around in your pocket. You know, things that you ask, right? And I'm not talking about the more flippant ones that you see, like, well, if it's, the, if it's from the Washington Post or the New York Times or CNN, you know that it's a legitimate news source. Well, I just got done saying. Those sources are full of misinformation and disinformation, and it's not always a mistake. And we know this. Brian uh, Covert did a whole piece in our 2017 book on the mighty Wurlitzer, played by the mighty Wurlitzer, which is actually the large, long-standing CIA disinformation program to work with American journalists. There was a small subset of it referred to as Operation Mockingbird that was purportedly discontinued, but... The whole process of manipulating uh, news media is ongoing. It's still happening. And now the CIA doesn't even have to go very far because Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, also has a contract with them. Right? And we even saw this past two weeks uh, the former head of the CIA um, under Clinton come out and say, well, yes, the CIA does manipulate elections, that we do meddle in elections. But he said when we do it, it's for good cause. So like I told you, they're not even denying it anymore. Yet, we're supposed to now just believe that these people who have been lying all along are now telling us it's for our own good. Pot, meat, kettle. And that the Russians are the problems. Again, what I'm getting at here is the problem is that we have a paucity of understanding while we're awash in a sea of information. We live in a culture of information overload and we have too much information at our ready access, and we don't have enough time or we don't make enough time to process it, analyze it, ask questions about it. We're just clicking, liking, and sharing, and we're spreading this information virally around the web. I wish we were spreading virally around the web Susan Merritt's information integrity checklist. 
I'd like to just affix it to every article that goes around everywhere so that you could maybe, hey, wait a minute. Before I actually like, share, or click anything, where's that checklist? <laughs> and now let me actually read the entire article before I comment on it, like it, or share it. You know, a majority of people, and we know this from Pew Press, we know this from the Stanford study, a majority of people that are liking, clicking, and sharing things on the internet aren't even actually reading them. So, again, the problem, we can point fingers at these big tech companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter. We can point fingers at the big corporate media. We can point fingers at, quote, journalists like Chuck Todd that bemoans that he can't ask his guests the tough questions or they won't come back on his program. But at some point, we need to come back and actually point the finger at ourselves. Because outsourcing these solutions means more censorship, more concentrated propaganda, more deception, and a more easily controlled public. We know who's pulling the wires that control the public mind, as Bernays said. Why are we letting them do it? Why are we letting these big tech companies get away with this kind of stuff without regulation? And of course, we saw the little dog and pony show in Washington not long ago where the big tech companies had to come and pretend to be worried, right? You know what the big tech companies are worried about coming out of Washington? What are they worried about? They don't want to be regulated. So that's why they keep saying that they're not news media and they're not journalists and they're not responsible for journalism because they don't want to have any kind of regulation on their business. That's what they're afraid of. But that's why Facebook created its news integrity group, its, its, its news group. That's why Google is suppressing uh, news searches. That's why uh, these other companies are fooling around with algorithms. That's why this stuff's happening. It's happening because they want to appear as though they're dealing with fake news, but they're dealing with it by censoring information. And as I mentioned with Proper Not, a lot of the information that's being censored is information that challenges the overarching ideological bias that we have in our news media and in our political culture in general. And that is, uh, actually, that was just literally admitted to in the New York Times, strangely, about a week or so ago, while simultaneously pretending that there is no bias at the Times and the idea that somehow this is objective journalism, the Times, the Post, etc. The lead editor over there said, well, of course, we're a pro-capitalist, you know, we have a pro-capitalist ideology. But this is after he was just saying that they didn't have an ideology. And again, and in the United States, having a pro-capitalist ideology is like asking a fish, how's the water? That it's so ubiquitous and it's so obvious that nobody bothers to call it out. And in fact, the news media masquerade, the corporate news media off masquerade under the moniker of objectivity, even though we know they're not objective and we know who they're serving. They're not serving the general public, they're serving their shareholders. Just like Les Moonves said they were. When he said, keep going, Donald, you might be bad for America, but you're damn good for CBS. Again, this stuff's all out there. All this information is out there. This stuff is documented. We know that this stuff is going on. Again, the Ovedia stuff, to me, was some of the, the more troublesome in terms of where people who are in technology see this going, right? And so once again, I have to come back to the idea of a solution that doesn't involve blacklisting, that doesn't involve censorship, that doesn't even involve more technology to create code or algorithms that will suppress things for us. What we need is we need, again, simple, critical thinking kinds of pedagogies. We need to be taught how to ask the right questions. As a matter of fact, one of the textbooks I've long used in one of my courses is simply called Asking the Right Questions. It's a primer on critical thinking. It's stuff that people should be learning in elementary school, but guess what? In the United States, there is no requirement in public education for critical media literacy. There just isn't. Other major industrialized countries and quote democracies have long taught critical media literacy education through primary school, junior high, and grade school. By the time they get into college, they're doing more advanced kind of propaganda deconstruction, right? And they're understanding how to write 
uh, reasoned arguments, devoid of fallacious reasoning, and they're actually building on their intellectual skill sets. Much of what we do in the United States in the first couple of years of college is play catch up and try to teach people a whole slew of things that they didn't learn because they either weren't part of the curriculum or they weren't on the test, which is what the curriculum has turned into. It's turned into the private property of these education corporations that are now dictating public education policy. That's a huge problem, but it dovetails with this problem of our news media illiteracy. In fact, Nolan Higdon and I are actually working on a book right now about those two problems and how those two problems intersecting is what is creating this climate, this whole alleged you know, academic uh, terminology, right? Epistemological crisis that we're calling fake news. It's really an epistemological crisis. We are no longer as a society seemingly able to have civil disagreements. We're not able to kind of comprehend how somebody telling something that you've never heard before might actually be correct or factually accurate. We're not really seeing any kind of modeling of this in a lot of the news media. We certainly don't see the modeling of any kind of debate going on in the, in the presidential, uh, presidential circles. Or, I mean, that's just, that's literally a, like a three ring circus. Where, by the way, the corporate media moderators are not asking tough questions and they're not holding candidates accountable on positions. And that's not just me saying it, that's them saying it themselves. You know, the corporate media elites came and said after the election that they failed. I said, well, that's cool. We at least agree on something. Y you did fail. Or did you? <laughs> because it seems that it's by design that this failure is occurring. When, when you have people able to sit at their living room and scream at their TV and shake their fist and know that the obvious questions are not being asked, what's wrong with these people that get paid millions of dollars that they're not smart enough that went to elite journalism schools that they can't ask the right questions? Well, it's not because they're dumb. It's because they're paid not to ask. It's part of the problem. What we need to do is not only call out those problems, but we need to model the solutions. And again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, the solutions are ones that we lay out in our books every year in our Validated Independent News Project, where we have students review independent news sources, check them for information veracity, and we have them then do peer reviews with professors or other experts in the field to go and say, I need feedback on these topics. Tell me, you know, tell me more about where I can go to, to fact check and learn more about this. And then they come back on the other side and they're looking at where the news media coverage is and did corporate media cover these kinds of issues. And if the answer is no or no, they didn't cover it enough, we go back and say, okay, well, we, let's, let, this has been verified, this has been validated, this has been fact-checked, and it's not being adequately covered in the corporate press. It goes on the ballot to become one of our top censored stories of the year. We've been doing that since 1976. We have validated and vetted uh, thousands and thousands of stories. Only 25 a year end up in the book, but that means that since 1976, we've had over 1,000. And if you take a look through corporate media on those slow noon day, new, uh, news days where they don't have anything to do other than run Sam Nunberg for five hours, you just wonder, you know, as Ralph Nader said uh, about the project, he said, you know, this, this list, these books should be pinned on the news bulletins of every journalistic organization in the country. So whenever they get the urge to go on their junk food news binge, or the urge to run some nonsensical distraction for five hours, maybe one of them will pick it up and find a story that still is languishing in obscurity. You know, be the fourth estate, not be an adjunct of the state. And by that, I also mean a pawn of the two corporate parties. So we at the project think and believe that the real, the real way to address this issue is to expand our educational programs, to expand access to independent media, and to share that as far and wide as we can. This is something that we can do in, as individuals. It's something we can do as teachers. It's something we can do as parents. It's something we can do as neighbors. It's something we can do as community members. It's something we can do as students. It's just something that anybody can really actually do. But you have to want to do it. And you have to understand what the problems are. 
And I know I didn't go into the propaganda model by Chomsky and Herman, though I alluded to some of the facets of it, and Rob Williams and others have been updating that for the 21st century, just like Ovedia said, to talk about things like bots and algorithms and other things, not just owners, advertisers, elite sources, flack and ideology, but also deep state disinformation campaigns, bots, algorithms, technology, etc. There's all kinds of other ways to manipulate information. And we, right, we have to keep up with it. We cannot expect the people that are in those businesses or those industries to keep up with it for us. We're lucky that some of the people that are in, those, uh, in that business or in those industries, like Ovedia and others, have come forward and have said, Wait till you get a load of this. <laughs> if you think that this is weird now, wait till you see what's going to go on next year. Well, those are people that are sounding alarm bells that we ignore at our own peril. And I don't just mean that um, metaphorically as a decaying democratic republic, all aerial quotes, right? I mean individually with our own, the challenges that we're facing, whether it be climate crisis, uh, whether, which is, by the way, you know, also connected to our pollution crisis, our overproduction and consumption crisis. These things are all looped together. And these are things that we're all going to have to face, which, by the way, is also the thesis and topic of Peter Phillips' next book on the transnational capitalist class, where he's been merging a lot of the research he's done over the years through uh, political sociology, but also media, to talk about this problem of a plutocratic global oligarchy and that their quest and search for profits and control are leading us to the brink of, of utter disaster. And why are we not doing more to mitigate that? Why are we not trying to be in touch with these people? Why do we not communicate with people in media? Why do we blindly continue along in our daily habits and consume the things we do and, 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 and sort of routinize the bad habits that we have, the degree to which we no longer analyze them anymore? We're like the fish that doesn't know it's in water anymore. Again, I'll end on this note that I strongly think that the antidote to fake news is critical media literacy education. And I think that we have, again, really kind of, we're approaching the zenith here. I'll end with a quote from the historian Daniel Borston, who wrote a fantastic book in 1961 called The Image, A Guide to Pseudo-Events in America. In other words, he was talking about fake news in 1961, where he wrote, we risk being the first people in history to have been able to make their illusions so vivid, so persuasive, so realistic, that we can live in them. This is our filter bubble, right? But, and, and we have reality apathy, right? These are the newer terms. And that we now try to make ourselves impervious to the objective, empirical world around us. We, in fact, are so inundated with this kind of phenomenon that Oxford Dictionary in 2016 coined the phrase post-truth, hyphenated word, the word of the year, post-truth as word of the year, right? Relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So we live in a post-truth world with fake news and alternative facts, right? That was Kellyanne Conway's gift to the lexicon, alternative facts that are the stuff of fake news that help us hide and be safe in a post-truth world. Well, at Project Censored, we don't believe in a post-truth world. We believe strongly, as the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore did, when he wrote that the truth comes as a conqueror only because we've lost the art of receiving it as a guest. This is why we need critical media, uh, critical media literacy education. This is why we need critical pedagogy. And this is why we really need to face up to the empirical facts of the world around us. And we need to get really busy, not just talking about these things, but actually doing something about them rather than sort of just fold in to our own myopic and complacent silos. That really is not an option. 
So I hope that some of you will agree that that really isn't a viable option, and you'll share with us the things that you're doing, maybe the ways that you think that this uh, challenge and this crisis ought to be faced, and m maybe where you see areas of intersection or agreement, maybe you'll contact us and maybe you'll do work with us at Project Censored. On the radio show, we have another film project. Andy and I are working on another book right now. Um, we're on over 20 campuses around the US, including here at Sonoma State, where we were founded. So ultimately, after all of this, my real motives are, uh, I hope, obvious. We, won't, we don't do this by ourselves. We can't do this by ourselves, and we need your help. And not only do we need your help, we think in our country, in the US, and around the world, I think we all need to be helping each other. And I think that's really the only way that we're going to be able to map our way through this incredible, bizarre, surrealistic, artificially, intelligently designed realm of fake news. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to hear your comments, questions, and suggestions. And I'd also love to hear if anybody here is doing something, working on something, or wants to be part of what we're doing at Project Censored. So thank you very much.